In general, irrespective of the material model, we perform some simple controlled experiments to measure a material's response to the applied load and then we calculate the material properties from this measured response. For instance, in case of metals, we perform simple uniaxial tension test on a dog bone coupon and once we get the data points for stress versus strain, we fit a straight line to this data which gives us a slope and the x-intercept. Since the material usually has zero stress at deformation, the x-intercept is just zero. So we're left with calculating just the slope, which is nothing but the Young's modulus of the material. In order to calculate the Poisson's ratio, we need to perform a separate experiment. But the idea is still the same. We try to fit the appropriate equation to the measured data and calculate the material properties. Before we see how this is extended to hyperelastic materials, let's do a quick review of the stress tensor. The stress tensor of a material has two types of stresses, the normal and the shear stresses. In case of normal stress, the material could be either undergoing tension or compression, which are again two different modes of deformation. So, Overall, there are three modes of deformation seen in the material and one must understand how the material behaves in all three modes of deformation. In case of metals, they follow Hooke's law, which states that the material's stress strain response is linear and this extends to all the modes of deformation. Also, the metals have same stiffness in both tension and compression. Even the shear response can be calculated from the uniaxial response and the solution is unique too. So, in case of metals, one can accurately predict the full deuteric behavior of the material by measuring its response in only one mode of deformation. However, this is not the case for soft materials. Soft materials such as elastomers, rubbers, and soft tissues have nonlinear responses in all the three modes of deformation. Due to this, the stiffness of the material is different in all three modes of deformation. Although in theory, one can still calibrate all model parameters using data from just one mode of deformation, but the solution is not unique due to nonlinear nature. So, one cannot accurately predict the full deviatoric behavior of hyperelastic materials by measuring response in just one mode of deformation. So, the material must be tested to measure the response in the three independent modes of deformation, which are uniaxial tension, uniaxial compression, and simple shear. These three modes are required to accurately characterize the deviatoric material behavior of hyperelastic materials. There's a fourth mode of deformation which also needs to be measured to calibrate the volumetric behavior. In this case, the material is subjected to confined compression where the material is constrained from deforming in all the directions except the loading direction. This way, the stress state created in the material is predominantly volumetric. The change in volume is calculated from the applied load and the hydrostatic pressure is measured using load cells to obtain the hydrostatic pressure generated due to controlled change in volume. One important thing to note in all these cases is that the material should be undergoing homogeneous deformation, meaning the strain is uniform at all points of the body. This is very important in calibrating the hyperelastic material models. But it's not always practical to achieve such a state during controlled experiments. 
This can be due to several reasons, such as properly gripping the sample in testing apparatus, or difficulty in procuring the sample, especially in case of soft issues. And sometimes, the material response is even affected by the frictional forces between the sample and the apparatus. The problem with using such data is that there are additional forces registered in the response and the calibrated material will either be stiffer or softer than the actual response. Let's look at each of these modes of deformation and how are they tested for. Let's start with uniaxial tension. This is the most popular testing method as it's relatively easier to conduct. In this test, the sample is held rigidly between two clamps. One of the clamp is held fixed while the other is moved to create a state of tension and the reaction force is measured by a load cell. One thing worth noticing is that in this type of testing, the sample is usually cut in the form of a dog bone and not a simple rectangle. This is because when a rectangular sample is rigidly held between the clamps, the resulting deformation is not homogeneous and cannot be used for calibrating the material model. Instead, a dog bone sample is used. In this case, the material is held rigidly at the wider ends, but due to the difference in the cross sections, the material at the neck is relatively free to deform. So, it creates a nearly homogeneous deformation in this region. This is still not fully homogeneous, but practically this is good enough. Now, let's look at compression testing. Generally, a cylindrical sample is sandwiched between two plates and one of the plates is held at rest while the other moves such that it creates a state of compression. But the issue with this method is that if there's friction between the plates and the sample, then the sample is not free to move at the interface and as a result, it starts bulging at the center, which creates a non-homogeneous state of deformation. So, the sample and the plate must be well lubricated before testing to avoid this behavior. But this may cause trouble with holding the sample in place, so it won't slip away from the apparatus, which is both a waste of experiment and may also damage the apparatus. As an alternative, in case of fully and nearly incompressible materials, we perform another type of test called as biaxial test. This is neither uniaxial nor is it compression. So how is this considered a substitute? Since the material is stretched in two directions, due to its incompressible nature, it will undergo compression in the third direction. Recall from the definition of Jacobian that it is the product of three principal stretches. In case of fully or nearly incompressible materials, we can set its value to one, which leads us to this relation. So, by controlling the values of lambda one and lambda two in our experiment, we are able to control the amount of compression in the third direction. We can make it even simpler by using the same amount of stretch in the other two directions, which is nothing but the equibiaxial tension test. This way, one can mimic the homogeneous compressive response without being affected by the friction. Note that this relation holds good only for fully or nearly incompressible materials. In case of compressible materials, the Jacobian is not equal to 1 and in fact is a function of the three principal stretches. So, this relation is no longer user controlled. Also, note that the biaxial tension response is a replacement for the uniaxial compression test, but the two responses are not equal. Finally, 
Let's look at shear. In case of simple shear, it's a constant volume deformation where the two sides remain parallel to each other. In general, a sample is bonded to two parallel plates and one plate is moved in lateral direction while the other one is held constant to generate a state of shear. The success of this state relies on a strong bond between the sample and plate to have a no-slip boundary condition between them. Such a bond is not easier to have for rubbers and soft tissues. So, this method is also used sparingly. Instead, we measure another kind of stress state called as pure shear. The difference between simple and pure shear is that in simple shear, the two sides remain parallel but the sides that were perpendicular to begin with do not remain that way. So a rectangle changes into a rhombus. But in case of pure shear, the sides remain both parallel and perpendicular. So a rectangle remains a rectangle but with different dimensions. This state is usually achieved in an experiment called as planar tension. In this case, a tall, thin sample is clamped along its longest side, one side is held at rest and the other is moved to create a state of tension. As you notice, this is similar to a uniaxial tension test. So how is it any different? It's in the shape of the sample. The key here is that the sample is thin and the length is almost 10 times more than its height and the sample is stretched along its length. By doing so, the deformation along its length due to incompressibility is almost negligible. This creates a biaxial stress state along its cross section. As a result, the plane along the diagonal is in a shear state. Once again, this is possible only in case of fully or nearly incompressible materials and this approximation cannot be extended to compressible materials. This way, one can capture the shear mode of deformation in the materials without worrying about the failure of bond at the interface between the plates and the sample. These are the typical methods used for characterizing the deviatoric behavior of the hyperelastic materials. Just to reinstate, we only need data from at least one mode of deformation to calibrate the material model. However, it's recommended to use data from as many modes as possible to accurately characterize the material model. Also, the calibrated material model is reliable only within the ranges of strain for which the experimental data is available. The model can still be used outside of these ranges, but the analyst must verify the results and use them with caution. 